Hi everyone, it's me, Carrie. In this video, I want to talk about a concept called the circle of PLLs. But first, what am I showing on the screen right now? Well, it's a diagram showing the 22 possible PLL cases you could get on a Rubik's Cube, where the size of each PLL is proportional to how frequently that PLL will show up in a random speed solve. And I've also circled various subsets like ePLL. But to explain further, let me drag this out of the way because I have this open in Adobe Animate where I can like move stuff around. So first, let me get rid of the bubbles and zoom in to this cleaner image. So the reason why I think it could be useful to size cases based on frequency is say you're a beginner speed cuber just learning PLL for the first time. Looking at this image, you can intuitively see that it will be four times as useful to learn the F perm than it would be to learn the NA perm because the F perm will show up in four times as many solves, so that's four times as many times that will go down. And you can also think of this as a dart board, where every time you do a speed solve, you throw a dart at this board, and wherever it hits is whatever PLL you, you get. So it's like, dang, I'm not gonna hit that H perm very often, but there's this huge swath of G perms in the middle. Like, what is that? A quarter of the board? Well, almost. I'd better learn my G perm algs pretty quickly. Well, I know them, but this is a hypothetical. Anyway, if you're curious why the NA perm is so infrequent, well, let's look at a more typical PLL like the T perm, which this diagram suggests happens one in 18 times. So I have two Rubik's cubes and let me hold them in different orientations where both of them have white top, but I have blue in front here and orange in front on this one. If I do perform a T perm on them right now, well, they will both look like T-perms to you, like, as an experienced speed cuber, you know that, like, it's not that important to look at the colors themselves, but the relations to the color. But the actual pieces are in different places, like, uh, the orange and white edge here is not solved, it's in the opposite position. But on this cube, the orange and white edge is solved. So these are technically two different permutations of the Rubik's Cube. So... You know, there's four different angles, so there's like four times likelihood that T will show up. But what happens if we try doing NA or NB? I don't really know which one is which. Well, if we do the same thing where we hold these two cubes with the same color top but like different front color and do the NA perm. So... At first glance, it might be like, oh yeah, they are different. But actually, if you do some AUFs, they're exactly the same. Like the last layer is exactly the same case. So because NA has this fourfold symmetry, there's only one way in which it could actually arise. Whereas T perm, there's four ways. Anyway, you probably already knew that. So um, let's move on. So when I was adding these like circled areas for subsets of PLL, I noticed that each one covers exactly one sixth of the area of the hole. And now if you're like, if you've been speed cubing for a while, this is not surprising because whenever you have any sort of like case where you have like four objects that need to be permuted correctly, but you can freely AUF it, then you'll probably realize that there's a one sixth chance it'll already be solved. There's a one sixth chance you'll have a diagonal swap and a four sixth chance you'll have adjacent. And this is sort of like the mantra of speed cubing. It shows up everywhere on three by three, on square one, on maybe even skewed, because like you, oh no, that's a different thing. But like, it'll show up like for all various puzzles. And I'm not gonna like explain why that is, because you can probably figure it out. But it, you know, it kind of makes it feel like solved and diag are kind of opposites, or they're like the yin and yang of each other. So if we go back to this image, oh, okay, by the way, I'm calling this circle of PLLs because I feel like it feels analogous to the circle of fifths in music theory, where if you kind of, you start with C and then you go to its dominant, you, you get G and then G and its dominant D. If you keep doing that, eventually you get around and full circle back to C after 12 iterations. And what I'm about to do feels similar. And by the way, I wouldn't be surprised if some other speed cuber has already like discovered this stuff. So if it goes by some other name, let me know in the comments because I'm probably not the first. I'm definitely not. Anyway, so when we come back to this image, we have the E PLL circled in purple and the orange or the diagonal PLLs circled in orange. 
and the EPLLs mean there are solved corners. Why is my webcam not focused? And diagonal PLL means the corners, like on this end perm, if you were to swap a diagonal pair of them, you would have solved corners. So the fact that we have CPLLs here, which is solved edges, it feels like something's missing, right? Because solved corners, two diagonal corners, this is an analogy, is like analogous <laughs> to solved edges versus diagonal edges. But what, what would that even mean? So, okay, by the way, um, hold up. When I say solved edges, it's like with an A-perm, if you ignore the corners and just look at the central edges of each, like, oh, I'm sticking up the middle finger, each face, they're all solved on an A-perm, which means that, like, you can do a lot of things, like, solve it with a corner commutator or, like, do it Megamink style. Um, but, yeah, that's the A-perms, E-perm, and H-perm too. Wait, I did that wrong. If you, like, if you have an H-perm and then you do U2, the edges will be solved. So that's why H perm is in the overlap. Okay, so I, I mentioned diagonal edges PLL earlier. So what would that mean? Diagonal PLL means if you do a swap of these two, the corners are solved. So diagonal edges is more like opposite edges because they're not diagonal. If you swap them, then it will be solved. So an example that I like quickly thought up is T perm because like you know, the front and back are solved, but left and right are not solved. Um, so before I get into like which ones, which PLLs are actually opposite edge PLLs, um, what I want to do is draw out what will become the circle. And maybe, okay, I'm, I'm doing this on the fly with my drawing template, so let's see what happens. So I'm going to have the the corner PLL information on the Y axis. Wait, let me, let me see if I can figure this out. So let's put edge PLLs. I need room to write stuff. Edge, no, this is EPLL. But the real meaning of EPLL is solved corner. Zzz. And then on the bottom, I'm gonna draw diagonal PLLs solved, no, diagonal corners. And so like the y-axis is what tells us sort of information about the PLL. And obviously we care more about corner permutation than edge permutation because corner permutation can't be changed with two gens. So it matters a lot more based, like your PLL speed will matter a lot more based on corner permutation than edge permutation. But let's do edge permutation anyway. So then this one will be the CPLLs. Um, I don't know if I can write it. This is not going to work well. I'll just write it somewhere. This is sol solved edges. And then right here is the mysterious, what do I call it? Opposite I don't, there must be another term to describe this, opposite edge PLLs. And obviously you can't be in both cases at once. If you are a CPLL, then you're not an off edge PLL. And if you're an EPLL, you're not a diagonal PLL. Okay, so let's just start filling it out. So the EPLLs, well, let's just do U perms first because like that's the first one everyone thinks of. But based on the diagram we saw earlier, there's this interesting overlap where the skip case and the H perm could be considered both solved corners or solved edges. So they go in the sort of Venn diagram overlap of these two bubbles. We have, wait, I, I'm looking at this diagram because this matters what I do, H and skip. And then, oh, actually, no, I, I was gonna not actually write it in. I was gonna drag the little diagrams in. Let's see if I can actually do that. This might make the video weird. UA, UB, and then, because this way you also get to see the size of these little tiles, which is what I wanted to demonstrate. So this is H, this tiny guy's H and skip. And what I want you to notice before we fill out the rest of this circle, although it's more of a square, is that there's four times more mass in this area, like that's in the EPLL bubble 
There's four times more area here than there is in this overlap. And let's see if that continues. Ooh, cliffhanger. Okay, let's look at the CPLL solved edges that only belong in this one area here that aren't in the overlap yet. Those are just the A perms because it's like, if you have an A perm, it very clearly is a cycle of three corners and has nothing to do with uh, edges. So yeah, solved edges. Okay, so um, let me think, what should I do next? I guess I'll, I'll do this thing here. So what is a corner CPLL that has diagonal corners? Oh, wait, sorry, okay. Solved edges, diagonal corners. I think it's easiest if I just say that. Well, it's an E-perm, uh, long story short. Because E-perm, man, I need to do these PLLs. I should edit this video, but you know, I can't be bothered. With an E-perm, e I mean, you already know this, but the edges in the middle, they're all solved. But if you just look at the corners, you get diagonals or opposites everywhere. So that explains it, although you already knew that. Okay, diagonal PLL is a pretty commonly known subset, so it's like, I don't need to explain what it is. Y perm and V perm are also here. But before I move on, like, you probably guessed this. Look, like, there's two chunks of mass in this overlap again, and there's eight chunks of mass in the, like, non-overlapped areas. Okay, so now you get to opposite edge PLLs, and this is where, um, like a T-perm, like, there will be two edges that swap, and then there will be two edges that are already solved. Um, so the E-PLL that is like that is the Z-perm, because even though it looks like every edge moves, if you solve one of the edges, then two will be solved, and then two will not. Right, like, oh, no edges are solved if I do that. Now this edge is solved and this edge is solved, but these are not. So it is an opposite edge PLL. Okay, and then what goes here? Well, actually, no, let's do what, what goes here. Um, diagonal PLL and opposite edge PLLs. I mean, this is kind of like the worst of the worst, which is why I'm not surprised that the end perms end up here, but it also isn't surprising because the thing it does to the edges, which is swap the two furthest away edges, is also what it does to corners, so that's not surprising. Okay, and then the last ones that end up here, by now, like, you, we can tell that, like, there's going to be, like, two big squares. That's what there always is. So I think it's the T-perm and the F-perm. Where are you, F? I've got to zoom out because I want it. So, yeah, this is the circle. Um, and, yeah, I already talked about the mass. There's like this symmetry of like two chunks, eight chunks, two chunks, eight chunks, two, eight, two, eight, two. So it's it's kind of like almost like symmetrical and beautiful in a way. But then there's all these like other random PLLs just sitting in the corner and like what gives with that? Well, okay. I think they belong in the middle because like the adjacent category is kind of in the middle of both dimensions, right? But one thing I was thinking was on a square one, do I have a solved square one with me? On a square one, there's certain PLLs that are very easy to do because they preserve blocks. And by a block, I mean like an edge and a corner attached together. So what if we include that on our diagram as well? Well, that includes the J perms, which I'm gonna put in the middle because that's where I think all the adjacent PLLs should go. But it also includes the N perms. But the solved case is also in that because if you look at a solved, oh, I messed that up. If you look at a solved PLL, it's like blocks are preserved technically. Um, why are you auto saving? So th this would be really weird. Maybe this doesn't fit in the circle, but this, oh, this is so ugly. Actually, let me do a different color. Let's do green. This circle here is, I don't know what you call it, block PLLs. I guess another way to define block PLLs is uh, can be solved with block commutators. I, I believe. So um, if you do like R wide prime, D prime, R, like that kind of stuff, I don't want to like define it, but I think you know what I mean. 
like if you I can't get a good angle but you can do like an end perm like like you, uh, I, I, I'm not even describing it that well but see there's an end perm but it's like we're taking out two pieces at once and like storing it in this like storage area and then we're moving it over and then like placing it in a new storage area but every time we do stuff like this we're treating like the corner edge here as one giant piece that never changes and there's only four PLLs you can get to, which are the J perms and the N perm and the skip. But what's interesting about this, this like diagonal group is that every other group on the circle has a total of two plus eight plus two equals 12 chunks of mass. And by the way, a chunk of mass is one over 72 of the entire group, but the green one has 11. So, um, that's weird, right? Because like if everything else has 12, then you would think the pattern should maintain and it should be 12 in the green one, but there's 11. And well, okay, maybe it's not surprising that there's only 11 because it's a different subset than all the others. But I thought it was weird, but I think the real reason there's 11 is because, um, uh, I don't know if I wanted to like explain that too, because maybe it will take too long. But what I think it is, is there's actually two subsets of the block PLLs, one where you like attach the edges clockwise and one where you attach the edges counterclockwise. And it looks, it looks like, okay, if you, I'm not just, I'm not explaining this very well. Like if you have a square one and you always hold it in alignment, what PLLs can you get to? And it's like H, J, A, and and A, I don't know if it's the same letter. I'm not going to bother to check, but you know what I mean. Um, actually, let me size them correctly. So we have H, which is tiny because it's so symmetrical. No, not H. What am I talking about? It's not H, it's solved. I'll just do S for solve or skip or whatever. But that counts because, you know, you can reach that from the same subset. And then you have J, A. And you have N, A, which is small again. So J, A is four times larger than N, A. And I'm doing it long instead of like big square. For reasons you'll see later um and then what pll's can you get to when the top layer is out of alignment and you do something like i don't know like that see now you get a different set of pll okay yeah you get a different set of pll's where the edges and corners are now attached in the other direction like yeah it's like j perm versus l perm right and like solve is also part of that subset so it's like uh, you could draw them as like intersected like this. So if you're still looking for like where the six comes from, well, like the length of this is six and the length of this is six. Oh, this is NB. What am I talking about? Or JBNB. Like what I'm saying is um, there's really two sets of block PLLs and they each have a mass of six, but because they overlap with the solved case, this whole thing together is 11. And that's my explanation for why, um, yeah, why this is 11, but all the purple guys have 12. 12, 12, 12. And like, this might seem like weird theorizing that isn't actually useful, but it might be helpful to know that like, oh, if you're doing some sort of square one method that ends with PLL, you will have a one in 72 or 11 in 72 chance of having a block PLL that can be solved by holding it in the same alignment for the like rest of the PLL. Whereas there is a 61 out of 72 chance you'll have to do something different, like shift it out of alignment somehow. But of course that's not counting parity, but like this whole thing is assuming there's no parity. I'm actually sure that like if you were to do the PLLs with parity, you could create something that looks like this, but it would be like the, the O perms and the, the P perm and all that other stuff. Yeah, so I think this this is the circle. I don't know if, like, maybe this is super basic and everyone already knows this, but I still just wanted to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, okay, the G perms and R perms, I don't really know what to do with them. Again, like, they're adjacent adjacents. Actually, like, if you really wanted to be methodological, you could assign, every, like, six rows, each one for a different corner permutation, and you have solved like bar in front bar in left bar in right bar in back and then on the vertical one vertical axis 
you could have the edge permutation where it's also solved like and then like the edges are solved in the, the four adjacents and then there's the the opposite and then like if you were to graph that then then like there would be like a four by four grid in the middle and then like the g perms would each take up four squares of those chunks in the middle but they wouldn't be they would not be like all like contiguous i don't think so it wouldn't be as pretty as this because you just have like a bunch of like checkerboard patterns and like squares that wouldn't you wouldn't like and this is kind of cool because um it's sort of like there's just one ua perm there's one uv perm we don't want to like see all the duplicates yeah okay um that's my video thanks for watching bye